Is my microphone okay? Okay, I can hear it. <laughs> um, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the future of uh, data science education. About me, my name is uh, Jose Portilla. I'm the founder of Perian Training. Um, like it was just said, we teach uh, programming, data science, machine learning, both to consumers and enterprise clients. And then I'm also an instructor on a platform called Udemy, um, and we teach over uh, 3 million students there through uh, self-paced online courses. Um, so we're going to be discussing the future of data science education. But before we talk about the future, I think it's good to level set and talk about the need uh, for data science education. So why specifically do we need um, data science? Um, and also, what's the present situation in data science? And then we'll move on to discussing um, future elements. Uh, and one quick note before we continue. Um, I am from the United States, so this uh, talk in general experience uh, is stemmed from an experience rooted in the United States. So we have, like, let's say, unique characteristics of our educational system there, um, to put it lightly. So just keep that in mind. OK, so let's talk about the need for data science education. So why specifically um, do I, or we believe, that we need an education that's specifically designated as data science education? Um, if you meet a current data scientist today, uh, it's very likely that they uh, didn't uh, study data science um, formally? And why is computer science and statistics themselves not enough? So I think there's a couple of key factors here. Um, one is that data science, as you probably, if you're in this room, you know, is a uniquely multidisciplinary field. Um, it's also a necessary skill set for the upcoming modern workforce. And there's just, in general, a huge need for data scientists across many industries. So as I mentioned, data science is, I think, a uniquely multidisciplinary field. Um, it's often uh, discussed as a unique intersection between like mathematics and statistics as well as computer science. And you'll often see another third circle there in the Venn diagram of some particular domain experience. And unfortunately, in many formal academic institutions, uh, computer science itself falls under the School of Engineering. And again, this is kind of rooted in the United States. Um, and statistics itself is under the Department of Mathematics. And if we think about what the motivation is for a current student in the framework of kind of classical academic institutions, so going to college or university, um, really probably what they're looking for is some sort of future employment opportunities. And what our employers are looking for in students is some sort of clear signal that this person um, knows what they need in order to be successful in the workplace. And if you're a practitioner of data science yourself, you probably have done learning on the job. And I think that's always going to be a critical part of the transition. Um, but I think still many day-to-day -day skills of a practicing data scientist in today's workforce um, can still be taught in a kind of classical academic institution. We just need to kind of define it a little better. Um, so just by show of hands, did anybody here uh, major um, in data science like as an undergrad? OK, we got one, um, two. So you can see there's not a lot of uh, academic institutions um, with an undergraduate degree that's specifically labeled data science. And you probably met uh, quite a few data scientists who majored in something else. Um, I myself studied mechanical engineering and thermofluidics. Uh, you probably met quite a few physics majors or mathematic majors or just general computer science majors who then you know, transitioned uh, into studying data scientists. So if our goal, again, is to help these students become employed as data scientists, we want to clearly signal a skill set to employers that, hey, this person actually knows uh, data science itself versus some esoteric you know, math degree. And if we think about the way skills have been moving throughout time, um, the modern workforce itself, even if you're not a data scientist, I think is rapidly changing. So the skill set of data science is also just going to be necessary, um, regardless if you actually have the job title of data science. So if you think back to maybe 20 years ago or the late 90s, um, and you look at a resume and what technical skills are on that resume, um, you may be surprised that some people you know, were listing things like Microsoft Office or Excel or Microsoft Word as like a technical skill. But now if you see that on a resume, um, it's almost like a red flag of like, why is this person listing Microsoft Word as a technical skill, right? Um, and it's just becoming assumed. So in the future, we're probably going to see these base skills of something like Python coding also just be you know, 20 years from now, some sort of uh, level set assumption that you're just going to say, oh, most people know some sort of coding. So these data science skills. Um, are going to be more and more necessary to operate um, as part of the modern workforce. So then if we switch to the employer side of the equation, 
um, I, I think I've heard other uh, members or speakers uh, mention this specific report. So in a 2022 um, IBM report, 35% um, of companies report using artificial intelligence in their business. And when I say AI, um, I'm probably more in line with um, the first talk uh, that Luke Julia gave that it's more like augmented intelligence. I'm not really discussing you know, general artificial intelligence, just colloquially talking about AI. Um, and an additional 42% of companies are exploring using AI. So the employers are definitely moving in this direction. And in this same survey or business report, um, the number one barrier to AI adoption was limited AI skills or expertise or knowledge. So clearly, the employers themselves have a need. Um, and I think a critical component here is that data science and AI actually represent unique ethical considerations as well. So even if you uh, think that a degree in computer science or a degree in statistics is enough, you're probably not taking an AI ethics course if you're just studying um, statistics, for example. And it's actually going to be more and more of a larger issue. So if we are able to get classical academic institutions to brand things as data science, we can actually have AI ethics as part of that curriculum in a more formal sense. And if we think back on the employer side of the equation, um, this is a kind of a crazy statistic that 74% of companies that are already using AI report that they haven't taken any steps um, to ensure trustworthy or responsible AI, um, which is probably extremely dangerous considering the bias that can live in data sets. Now, what about people that are already working today? So we talked about the students, we talked about the employers. Um, what about the current employees? So Salesforce has conducted what they call a digital skills index, and it's based on 22,000 workers across 19 countries. So it's a pretty international representation of people that are currently working, um, and includes lots of topics like the future of work, uh, job readiness, uh, continuous learning. And according to the Salesforce digital skills index, um, if we think about the latest cohort that's coming in to be an employee, um, only 7% of Generation Z respondents believe they had the digital skills in AI, and only 20% believe they had the appropriate coding skills. So there's a need here, not just on the student side and the employer side, but also the current employees um, feel like they don't have the current skill set. And the skills gap does come at a cost. So a Rand Europe report estimated that out of these 14 G20 countries, um, if they don't meet this skills gap, you're missing out on like 11.5 trillion cumulative GDP growth. Um, so kind of a huge potential here that could be lost. And even if this number was frankly kind of made up, uh, I think, by this report, let's say even if they're off by 90%, still like $1 trillion is a huge amount of productivity left on the table. OK, so I think we've explored the motivations and needs for data science education. Like I mentioned, it's uniquely multidisciplinary, um, combining things like mathematics and computer science. And I think it's deserving of its own major. Um, so hopefully, you know, 10 years from now, if I ask that same question, how many of you majored in data science? Um, there's going to be a lot more hands raised. Um, skills necessary for the modern workforce. Um, employers themselves are constantly expanding the work done in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then employees themselves, who are maybe in the field, um, as we just saw, especially that new cohort of employees, feel like they are missing uh, skill sets. OK, so what's the present situation in data science before we start talking about, I think, upcoming changes into the future? So we have that need. Um, what's the present situation? So there's a couple things I want to touch on. The sources of knowledge, um, online solutions that are currently available. Um, we'll touch again on academic institutions, certifications and degrees, as well as boot camp programs that you may have seen pop up. And we'll talk about them in the present sense, uh, maybe their pros and cons a little bit. And in the future, we'll talk about um, how we can take the best of all these ideas and hopefully deliver a great experience for students. OK. So Stack Overflow, you know, it's where you go to get your questions answered. Um, and so every year they do a Stack Overflow developer survey. And one of the questions is, how do developers learn to code? So already, the number one way is through other online resources. And I should mention here, if you're thinking about the percent of respondents, they can check multiple boxes. Um, so number one already is other online resources. So most people, um, their number one way of learning how to code is actually no longer in kind of a formal school. It's actually in other online resources. And you can see online in the survey is actually kind of listed twice, online courses, as well as as well as books and physical media. Um, so we kind of have this gap here where uh, coders in the current environment have to figure out a way to learn on their own because they didn't actually learn how to code in school. So what, what are the current online resources? Um, so just a little bit of a plug, even though I, I don't technically work directly for Udemy. Um, so websites and online resources such as Udemy or Coursera or Pluralsight or all these websites you've heard of. Um, what's nice is that they can provide meaningful content. And what's really nice about marketplaces like Udemy uh, they can provide uh, skill sets that are currently where the employer is at, right? So they can quickly spin up a course for the latest technology in something like 
uh, like Kubernetes, for instance, you probably are not going to find an undergrad college course that covers something like that, at least not in a United States most um, like statistics major or something like that. Um, and what's nice is then instructors have that flexibility to have those course materials directly relate to the real world job tasks more than things like general academic interests. Um, now, what's really nice about online resources um, like Udemy is that they can really scale. So I myself teach like 3 million students, which is kind of crazy. Um, that's a lot larger than what can be done at a physical university. So there's definitely a huge pro here with the current state of online resources. Um, I think one caveat here um, on the limitations of online options is while they're great, they're popular, and they're very useful, is they do have this sort of uh, one-size-fits-all approach that you can't really customize these to a particular individual versus in a physical institution, you can at least have like a tutor or a TA kind of give you more customized or personalized help. So there is that trade-off in being able to scale to a really large audience versus provide personalized help for someone that's learning this, especially if they're new to the topic. Um, so again, often these online platforms don't really have that good one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication support for students. And I should also mention, um, it can be great for motivated individuals, but sometimes it's pretty intimidated if you're new or less technical to the field. So uh, you'll often want that guidance. So let's say you really want that guidance and you look at the present state of academic institutions. So often the process of introducing new majors or updating course curriculums in a formal academic institution or university setting can be quite slow. It really depends on the university. Some, some are much better than others. Um, however, I should mention that as we look at data science kind of formal certifications from academic institutions, it does seem to be kind of flowing backwards from the higher graduate degrees. So uh, it's probably a lot more common to see like master's programs and PhD programs in data science versus undergraduate degrees. But we do see it kind of like flowing backwards. Did I click? Okay, good. Um, so as I mentioned, even right now in the digital age, uh, more than half of those developers are reporting that they learned to uh, code in school. So it's still pretty important for academic institutions to understand data science. Um, but again, data science, we already discussed, is more than just learning to code, right? It's that intersection. Um, so there's really that strong need for undergraduate students to have some sort of more formal skill set that can then signal to an employer that, hey, I know the skills of coding, mathematics, um, using something like pandas, et cetera. Um, so I should mention, for, uh, some universities are actually introducing data science degrees. So we had one here. Um, Stanford University, I think in 2021, just recently introduced data science as an official undergraduate degree, which is you know great. That's the direction we should be moving in. Um, I should, again, this is kind of from a United States standpoint. Um, academic institutions do solve many of the problems of online learning, such as providing tutoring, uh, class setting, individualized support. Etc. They're not really scalable to large audiences, so you can't just like infinitely scale Stanford University to uh, three million students to show up there physically, right? Um, but I should mention some universities. You may have seen these certification programs as well. They tend to be kind of outsourcing the actual teaching to third-party providers. So if you're looking online and you see something like, oh, data certification, data science certification from like UC Berkeley or Stanford, often they're actually like outsourcing that material and they're just lending their brand. Um, so it's more like a financial arrangement. Um, and so I mentioned this already, but uh, like top universities, especially in the United States, with those existing data science programs, they're extremely competitive. Um, often they don't actually increase the size of their student pool, so it's more like a uh, like prestige program, um, especially in relation to their resources. So not to pick up too much on Stanford, uh, I will <laughs> sing their praises later, but they have an endowment of like $36.6 billion, right? And they actually report their uh, performance um, on that $36.6 billion, has a 10.9% uh, five-year annualized return. This is kind of strange from a place that is really just there to teach students. Um, and with like $36.6 billion with great performance, um, it's almost acting like a hedge fund that also just happens to own a university, right? Um, however, there are some universities that are doing really great work in trying to merge these worlds of online resources and their, their physical institution. So MIT, I think, is a great example of this. Um, virtually any class on MIT can be uh, taken, or at least you can view the content online via MIT uh, open courseware. So it'd be great if more and more universities end up following this path, and I think MIT is setting a great example here in, in the present situation. And then finally, boot camps. So another phenomenon that has recently emerged, um, and you probably actually see these uh, flyers, are, are coding boot camps, uh, where small groups have like this intensive training into data science um, over a period of weeks or months. Um, in the United States, it's typically like three months, so like a quarter that your head's down. Um, another phenomenon, again, this is more probably towards the United States, 
But many of these boot camps have been experimenting with something called ISAs, which are income sharing agreements. So you actually don't pay anything up front. You just say, oh, once I get a job, I will give you 10% you know, of my salary for three years post getting that job in order to pay off my debt, so to speak, for the boot camp. So you would think that's uh, really great. So at first you think, oh, income sharing agreement, boot camps, um, perfect, because now the boot camp is completely aligned with you to make sure that once you take the boot camp, you get the job, otherwise the boot camp doesn't get paid, so to speak. Um, I would say if you look into this topic a little more, these income shared agreements, especially some investigative reporting, um, it's actually unclear how they operate behind the scenes. So you would think that if they actually keep the income share agreement on their books, so to speak, that they have to find these um, students a job. But there's actually usually a lot of stipulations on that ISA. For example, the student has to accept any job in any geographic location, or they forfeit the original ISA contract. So if you live somewhere like in Austin, Texas, and you're offered a job like in Chicago, um, that counts as getting a job. So now you either have to pay the boot camp or take the job in Chicago, right? Um, which may not be ideal for people with families or that don't have the flexibility to move. Um, and I think another issue with these ISAs, whoops. Um, is, and this is kind of uh, really fishy, um, and this is where the investigative reporting comes to place. Um, uh, some of these boot camps are actually packaging and selling these ISAs to third-party uh, financial advisors, um, or actually some of them are hedge funds, literally. And what happens is they essentially package these almost like mortgages in like 2007, 2008. So they will bundle the ISAs um, and basically have that payoff as an interest rate sell it to somewhere else, and now the boot camp already got paid. So then the boot camp doesn't even really care if the student gets a job afterwards. They already kind of offloaded that risk to someone else um, for like a higher interest rate. So just be aware of that. Um, it's kind of a strange time. And I think some of these are even illegal. So like in California, I believe the ISA is illegal because of issues like this. Um, and students are almost never informed of this practice. OK. So we have those online resources, academic institutions, um, boot camps. Um, there's still many trade-offs here. You saw in a lot of the situations, you know, the university has a trade-off that it can't really scale um, because it's a physical location, right? The online options have the trade-off of it can really scale, but it's hard to give that personalized uh, advice to somebody. And the boot camps themselves um, may have issues if they're dealing with ISAs or stuff like that. All right, so what do we believe to be the future of data science education, both for consumers and the enterprise customer? So I think as we look to the future of education, and I should point out a lot of these ideas um, are beneficial just to any education topic, not just data science education. But as we look into this, we should really be leveraging the uh, capabilities of data science to create a better future for data science education and education in general. So I think the future of data science education, and again, kind of education in general, is going to merge the best aspects of everything we just covered, whether it's online or university or a boot camp, to give a really nice balance between scalability and personalization. And a lot of these things are only really now possible with AI and large language models. So what are the things I want to talk about here on the future of data science education? So I think we're going to see a lot of individualized support with AI. Also going to talk about AI-powered adaptive learning software, um, automated testing and grading, automated course curriculums, as well as uh, built-in education inside software, and then hybrid cohort models for enterprise training to address that skills gap for people that are actually already employed in the field. So let's talk a little bit about individualized support with the use of uh, AI, so these large language models. Um, so there's as you're probably aware if you're sitting in this room, that there's been just huge improvements in these large language models. I'm talking about things like GPT-3, um, which if you haven't had a chance to play with, you know, go to uh, openailabs.com and then sign up for the API, and you can play around with the playground um, there. Uh, but clearly, if we combine these large language models with sources of information, we actually have the capability to have like a data science tutor or just a general tutor um, in your pocket on your phone or on your computer. So I think the future, you're going to see a lot more individualized support powered by AI. In fact, Google is developing AI-powered learning software and actually platforms, and they're currently being tested at universities. So right now, uh, Southern New Hampshire University is doing a test program uh, with Google of some student services that are powered by AI. And essentially, the way that works is the educators, so we don't take the humans out of the process completely, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, we do want to retain you know, humans, <laughs> especially for me. Um, it, the educators themselves build these competence, competency skill graphs. So, you know, I want them to learn pandas or scikit-learn or deep learning or statistics, et cetera. And then it's up to the AI to auto-generate learning activities for the student based off uh, feedback and inputs. 
So even just today, this Google AI-powered program that's being tested at this university that I talked about uh, can already generate things like short answer questions, multiple choice questions, uh, paraphrasing practice, and guided note taking. Um, in fact, I believe GPT-3 already has the capabilities to generate this um, on its own, even on just like a base, not fine-tuned GPT-3. So if you went to GPT-3 and asked it, hey, create some multiple choice questions on um, I don't know, the history of France or something, it would actually be able to generate that for you, even just today. And you know, GPT-4 is right around the corner. So it's just going to keep getting better and better. Um, and one more thing about Google, um, you know, the, the CEO himself, Sundar, uh, he's a huge proponent of using this AI in the educational space. And he even mentions it on earnings calls, um, which is not something you would think that would be uh, Wall Street would like to hear about. But he's, he said, um, you know, in the future, you're going to have a personal tutor uh, in your pocket. So you should really expect to see a lot of future efforts, especially coming from uh, Google machine learning for, and this idea of education for all, where you just open up your phone, ask it, hey, can you tutor me in this history or this aspect of data science or Python, et cetera? And the computer will able to provide that individualized support. And we've actually already seen some developments. I think this was just published like last week. So this is a really recent addition to my slides. Um, Galactica, um, has anybody heard of this? Raise your hand. OK, a few. So if you go to galactica.org, it's a large language model released from Meta, specifically designed to deliver like informational uh, type articles. So I would encourage you after this, go to galactica.org. Um, it's actually a really long waiting list to put your query and get results back, but it is available. Um, and it's the sort of kind of like fine-tuned large language model specifically for delivering things like factual information to help out students. So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing um, that Meta just released. And then we're talking about things uh, like the AI consistently adapting. So there's adaptive learning software. And I should point out that adaptive learning um, is not necessarily related to AI or machine learning. It actually already exists. And it's just a general term for being able to have an educational method that uses computer algorithms in some way, it doesn't necessarily need to be machine learning or AI, in order to deliver customized resources and learning activities um, to address the unique needs of each learner. So previously, adaptive learning software had to be predefined by some sort of developer. So it's almost like they're building out a tree that you know, if they get this right, then ask them this question. If they get this wrong, uh, don't ask them this question. And again, a bit of a, a US-centric approach here. But if you've taken something like a GRE or a GMAT for graduate school, that actually already had adaptive learning in it. It wasn't machine learning or AI powered. But essentially, the way that works is as you get more and more questions correct, um, it would actually give you harder and harder questions. Um, I did not know that when I took the GMAT and thought it was like the hardest test of my life, um, not realizing that it would keep giving you uh, harder and harder questions as you got more and more stuff right. Um, so then I was surprised at the end of my score. Anyways, um, so with a field as complex and multidisciplinary as data science, um, we can already think that it's not really going to be possible to do those classical adaptive learning approaches um, that we saw on something like GMAT, right? Like you can't really have a developer be able to write out a tree to check every line of your code, or also check out statistics, or create uh, ethics questions, et cetera, we're going to need the power of something like a large language model in order to do that. So can AI systems actually provide some sort of um, hyper-personalized, automated, adaptive learning system? So these AI systems, which is going to be, uh, it's kind of current day, but also being fine-tuned into the future. Um, when we get these AI-powered adaptive systems uh, powered by these large language models, we're going to see them actually be able to dynamically interact with students. And I know I kind of complained a little bit about Stanford University earlier being more like a hedge fund, but uh, I promised that we would you know, uh, raise them up again. So uh, code in place in 2021, it was like a summer program um, based off Stanford University's Computer Science 106A course, which is like an introductory to Python programming course. Um, and it's kind of this uh, free thing to do over the summer. It's volunteer teachers and educators. And they actually teach the basics of programming to 12,000 students over the summer. And as part of the latest uh, code in place in 2021, uh, a Stanford professor and AI researcher, uh, Chelsea Finn, uh, she actually helped develop one of these automated feedback systems. Um, so what it would do is it would actually automatically review code um, submitted by students and then give feedback in natural language. So when we say feedback, we're not talking about something like, you got question A wrong. Um, it's more like, hey, this code looks a little strange here. Have you considered doing uh, x, y, and z changes in a way that the student looks like a human actually gave the feedback, which is really cool. 
Um, and in fact, um, I think I already just mentioned this. Again, it, it's natural language feedback, but it's personalized feedback based to a specific user. So as you see, a specific user may be struggling with a particular topic. You would give them a more fine-tuned feedback in a way that makes sense and that it's natural language. So how did this actually perform? So this Stanford-developed AI feedback actually ended up providing more than 16,000 pieces of feedback. And students agreed with feedback 97.9% .9 of the time. And feedback, by comparison, um, by humans, uh, the, the agreement rate of students was only 96.7. They're so they're actually agreeing with feedback of the AI system more than the humans, uh, which kind of makes sense. Uh, the humans, you know, you'll get tired or something, and uh, you can't, you know, always be on or uh, constantly be, be getting the best feedback. Versus the AI system, you know, never gets tired, understands millions and millions of lines of code. It's been trained on all of Wikipedia, etc. So you should only expect this gap to uh, increase. And then kind of along with this idea is the idea of the automated course curriculum. So these AI systems are then going to be uh, easily expandable into actually creating uh, custom curriculums. And I think something that's kind of interesting is if we uh, keep going down this pathway, you may end up getting like hyper-personalized uh, undergraduate degree course curriculums. So maybe if uh, two people go to the same university and both major computer science, based on their own skills when they take different courses, um, the course curriculum itself may be different. So they may get like a different 106A than another student based off their needs, which is kind of exactly what you want. Um, so it's almost like every person has this, uh, not just a personalized tutor, but almost like a personalized university to their needs based off these large language models. And then along with these automated course curriculums, of course, you're going to be able to have a lot of things like automated assignments, um, uh, grading, et cetera. So a lot of these things are going to be kind of the main theme here, hyper-personalized. And if you think it's not really possible, you should just think of the technology that's already available today. For example, if you're a Spotify user um, and you look at you know, the uh, Spotify song recommendation list, you, know, you already see hyper-personalized technologies in a lot of other fields. Um, so it's only natural that we would see this for education as well. Unless you don't like your Spotify Discover playlist, in which case, you know, maybe you don't like your AI tutor. <laughs> um, so in general, the, this combination of um, AI, large language models, and software is going to allow these future teachers and educators to greatly expand their capabilities in teaching students about data science. Um, so mainly I've been talking about the world of kind of uh, classical academic institutions and what capabilities like these large language models are going to have on them with uh, hyper-personalization, feedback, et cetera. Uh, but remember, we still had that uh, skills gap based off that Salesforce uh, skills index. So what are we going to do about enterprise data science training? Because the current employee of a company maybe is not in quite the same situation as a student who, you know, it might be their full-time job to just be a student versus, you know, if you have work, you may not be able to just go back to university. So this is where I think hybrid cohort models are going to play a big role. So the enterprise learner, that is someone who's already employed, who maybe needs to upskill based off the needs of their employer, um, they're going to need a different path than these typical academic uh, students, right? So the solutions for enterprise clients, um, what we can do there is use what's known as a hybrid cohort model, so a little bit more about that. Um, in the past, and this is kind of, uh, things have changed due to the pandemic, but in the past, when an employer needed training, uh, you would have an instructor like me go on site. Um, you'd have you know, that group of eight to 10 employees, and you would teach them something like uh, deep learning with TensorFlow for like three to five days. So you would do it on site. And there's a lot of caveats there, because now you need to make sure all eight or those 10 employees are able to take those same days off um, from their normal job right, in order to learn. So now there's a big scheduling conflict. Um, and then post-pandemic, uh, now a lot of that has gone online, so it's like over a Zoom call, so it's kind of it's even stranger then. Um, and I think it's still highly beneficial to have instructor-led training sessions, to, so to have an expert there be able to answer specific student questions. Um, the nature of everything happening in person does have its limitations. So if we think about the way other end of the spectrum, if you, if you can't get everybody on the same schedule, remember you do have those online resources, like something like Udemy. So you could just tell all your employees, uh, go take that Udemy course. But remember, that lacks that personalization, and it's also going to lack that class setting. So you're kind of just alone, uh, jump into the pool, and hopefully you'll learn it. So the hybrid cohort model attempts to kind of bridge that gap. Um, and it attempts to bring both the best aspects of an instructor-led training and something that's totally online. So the way that works, and it's actually what we do at our company, is uh, we take those, that small group that would typically be taught in person, 
um, and we let them take the self-paced video content on their own individual schedules during the week, right? So now you don't need to worry about scheduling conflicts or getting these eight to 10 people to even like agree on some sort of a particular topic. Instead, what happens is they take the self-paced online courses on their own time, and then on a regular basis, like once a week, they get to meet with an expert um, and hopefully the expert also has domain experience in their particular field. And then, you know, once a week or twice a week, um, they can directly answer questions for the students. And then eventually you're going to have like an AI tutor along with that, that they can, you know, just pose a question to throughout the week. Um, so not to do a huge plug for our company here, but this is obviously uh, what we do for enterprise clients. Um, and it, it gives students that asynchronous uh, capabilities and training along with getting access to a specific instructor to answer their questions. And I think what, one of the key difficulties in developing this model is a lot of people tried to go the uh, backwards. So they had really good uh, instructor-led trainings, but then post-pandemic, they had to like suddenly try to fill out uh, this entire back-end library of self-paced video online content. I think in general, we got very lucky that we had kind of gone the other direction. We had all this self-paced video online content, and then we're able to easily find uh, the expert trainers in order to develop the hybrid cohort model. And then I think this is one of the last things um, on the future of education is just built-in education inside software. So maybe some of you have already experienced this with um, like users of GitHub, Windows, and Visual Studio Code. Um, you're probably aware of a GP3-based uh, Codex model, and that was trained on you know, all these public GitHub repositories. And the official product of that is called GitHub Copilot. So the model is called Codex, and then Copilot is the actual uh, software that's built into VS Code. And right now, it allows for just pretty robust auto-completion of programming tasks. And depending on your coding style, some people really love it. Um, and I think, holy moly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let's start over. <laughs> I'm going to go through some slides real quick. <laughs> We're not finished yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry. Now I regret having so many slides. <laughs> oh, no, not again. I'm not a... Uh... OK, <laughs> I'm trying to be careful here. <laughs> I'll switch sides as I'm walking across the stage. I think this is getting close to where we were. We were just talking about Codex and GitHub Copilot. I'm so nervous that this thing is going to fast forward again. <laughs> OK. All right, so back where we were. <laughs> uh, OK, so as I mentioned, uh, GitHub Copilot has this capability of auto-completion of programming. Um, but I think, and you can actually, you can, Codex, it's kind of, these models are kind of freaky because even though they're designed to really do one task, like auto-complete code, um, they're still capable of a lot more because they were trained on large uh, corpuses of text. So in the future, you should not just expect them to get better at generating code, but you should expect them to actually be able to explain existing code or offer suggestions for improving existing code. Um, so for example, you, you should be able to then have GitHub Copilot uh, look at your existing code or a colleague's existing code. And you can just, uh, through natural language, um, ask GitHub Copilot, hey, can you explain what this uh, line of code is doing? And in fact, GitHub, I don't know if some of you saw the demo, they're actually experimenting a lot with um, natural language interaction so that you would just like speak to your computer, and then it would generate the code for you. Um, so again, you're almost beyond having a, uh, a personalized auto-completion. You're going to have a, like a personalized uh, stack overflow built in within a Visual Studio code. And what's nice about this, or maybe not so nice depending how you feel about monopolization, is you know Microsoft owns Windows, it owns Visual Studio code, it owns GitHub, um, and it also has a huge investment in OpenAI. So that whole integrated vertical stack uh, operates quite nicely. Um, 
Okay, now I do want to point out that I think sometimes current members of academia may feel threatened by these like large language models um, advancements, but uh, we want to make sure that they're actually kind of more like augmented AI to come back to that original first talk at this conference. And in general, we want to focus on letting these tools help us be more human. So the AI tools, they're going to be doing what computers are good at, um, that allow humans to be good at what humans are good at, you know, having social interactions with people in order to teach them new topics. And then lastly, I think a key consideration is if everything I just discussed is going to come to fruition, is going to be true, that you're going to see these amazing um, automated tutors, we do have to then think about what is the current state of practicing data science going to look like. And um, based off some demos I've seen, I, I do think your operating systems more and more to the future are going to have natural language uh, feedback interactions, where, again, it's more like talking to Siri or your Google Assistant than actually uh, you know, clicking uh, buttons or keys. Um, so again, if we develop all these frameworks I've just discussed, we need to think about operating in future frameworks where the main way of interacting is through natural language and AI models. OK, and then one, one point I want to uh, say again is um, as these LLMs and no-code tools develop, um, we want to make sure that we always keep in mind these ethical considerations. Again, that's the need for something like a unique uh, data science major. All right, so what are the key takeaways? Um, as you're probably aware, there's a huge need uh, for data science skills inside the workforce. Um, you should expect to see large language models become more and more part of everyday software use, especially in the education field. Um, we saw already seen Google and Meta doing huge pushes there. And then on the enterprise side of things, you should expect hy hybrid learning models to become more and more popular. So as always, you know, the world needs more data scientists. Um, so we should be using data science itself to create more. And then just thank you to the Data Science Conference to uh, give me a chance to speak on this topic. And if you want to connect, there's my info. Um, oh, and the other thing I should mention is all the drawings you saw were generated by uh, AI, including this one. If, uh, so thank you. Teach on university. So I believe you are the one with the with the right questions here. So I don't have to. I mean, I have plenty, but we'll start with you. I think you you raised your hands first. I mean, before we get the mic, my question would be about the curriculum. I mean, uh, the curriculum has to be licensed, and if it is personalized, how do you do that? You know, that, that's actually a really good question because, in fact, the the GitHub model I just mentioned. Uh, is having a lot of like legal issues with that as well, um, in that you know it's reading all this public code, and it's kind of fuzzy how like what the legal licensing ramifications are if you're like generating new things, and you've seen those issues as well with uh, like the AI generated images. It's not clear like Stable Diffusion or things like Dolly what the like legal licensing parameters are for things that are like automatically generating. So I think that's still something, unfortunately, like always, the technology is moving faster than you know, the legal frameworks. Well, for the reason, because we're talking about universities, like the official mm -hmm. places to learn. So it, it cannot be you know, like hippie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think what's going to happen is it's just going like, to be slower because of those issues. Uh, Mike, did we get the microphone here? Uh, you said in the beginning that uh, uh, you know after 20 years uh, everyone will be knowing Python, and then also you told that uh, I think uh, very uh, uh, NLP based uh, you know coding is also possible nowadays. So given that given that situation, period training after 10 years, how you see yourself? What kind of trainings you would be providing? Because you are always you know, I would say ahead of times. So I would say, what kind of trainings after 10 years your institute would be providing? Um, I think what's probably going to have to happen is uh, there's going to be like more abstractions on the foundational topics. Um, I think you kind of look at physics as an example. So if you're taking a physics class in like 1900, there's a lot of atomic science there that just uh, you know is not talked about versus taking a physics class today. So I think you're just going to have to shrink focus on things that are like more foundational or more obvious based on you know, your own life experiences, you know, uh, having to program in general. 
and then uh, have a higher touch on the latest technologies. So um, less, less encoding and more on fundamentals. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. We'll, we'll see, I don't know. The future is yeah. interesting. <laughs> Next. Can't see, can't see any hands raised. Okay, there. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask, and you uh, actually started it, started talking about it, the legal issues and ethical issues. I've noticed that uh, there is a lawsuit uh, building up against um, uh, GitHub, and that uh, yes. AI generated um, um, approach, right, uh, against that language model. Uh, because, I mean, in some cases, uh, there was a verbatim uh, re reconstruction of licensed code, right? Something from open source, uh, but they didn't give the credit to the original author. So it's a real issue, and I'm wondering, as a data scientist, I mean, in the way how they train those models, I see it as a, a potential setback in development because they might, might shut it down legally, and then it's not really clear how you would develop a language model uh, that would actually give credit and avoid such issues. So I, I'm wondering, do you have some uh, opinion on that? What might be the approach to uh, go beyond such issues? Because if they shut it down legally, then we possibly won't have all those things that you're telling us here, uh, language, or large language models for education. Maybe mm -hmm. they shut it down. So possibly you have some ideas uh, how to actually approach such such issues where uh, they generate licensed code. Yeah, I, I think uh, probably the, the biggest fix there is really strong filters. Um, so for example, Dolly is kind of famous for having really strong filters on what kind of images you can generate. So you'd probably have to have some sort of automated system to understand the licenses of the code you're looking at. Uh, what's kind of interesting about these models, like if you put my name into GPT-3, um, it won't continue with a normal sentence, it'll actually start writing Python code because it's associated my name with like Python uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which is not like for the typical person, right? So even I personally have experienced the issue of like, well, this is kind of weird. It's, it's typing out the code that I wrote. Um, I think we'll have to see how that legal case actually builds out. Um, but yeah, strong filters. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Here. I can hear you. Um, I don't know if everyone else can. I don't think it's on. Okay, let's take this one. Hi. Hi. A huge fan of your courses. Learned a ton from them. So thank, oh, thank you, you for everything you've done for the data science profession. There is just one thing I kind of disagree with. I think even these days, if you're really good with Excel, you should put it on your CV. Yes, because yes, yes. there's a lot of like analyst positions where uh, Excel is widely used. And if you're like an Excel ninja, you will be all set to do them. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, so Excel, that's just Excel is its own uh, everything monster. Everything wanted to see. Yeah. Any other? Can't see. I mean, we are, we have like thirty seconds more. And I, I just want to ask you about alternative ways, because you're talking mainly about universities, mainly. I mean, but what would be the alternative ways to become a data scientist? Uh, I think based off like, the Stack Overflow developer you've seen, um, like online resources are going to be um, more and more of the accepted alternative. So the majority of people learning how to code do it online already. And hopefully you see some sort of blending of like MIT OpenCourseWare where you get the merging of classical academic institutions with online resources. So when employing a data scientist, what would you be looking for in his CV? Uh, if it I, is pretty blank when it comes to university and to official I, I think the, probably the best way to figure out if somebody knows the skills is just to ask them what have they created or what have they built and let them you know, discuss it or talk about it. So you don't it. think it, it will be a problem that, that they'll, this problem that the, he doesn't have a proper official education would occur? later in his career? Uh, I don't think so, because even today, you know, there's not that many official data science majors, so there's already some sort of uh, signal gap there. Um, hopefully that signal gap uh, gets narrower, but yeah, just asking people what they've created um, based off what they've learned, I think is the best way to figure out their skill sets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Jose Padilla.